questions in the room, I'll ask you to bring us some natural light, intermediate. Feel free to sit down so we, you can take questions and, uh, and we can have a discussion. Questions? Adieu. May I have the first one? So I have two that are very brief. One could be asked by Jose Obeso, which is, so if the activity of these channels makes them vulnerable, is it that the activity of the neurons, is it more like a use it or lose it situation? And second, when you showed, especially in the lysosomal uh, mitophagic, it looks like not all neurons in SNC have that enhanced... Uh, so are there subcell types in SNC that you think are especially vulnerable molecularly? Yeah. Okay, so both good questions. Um, so in the first case, I, um, you know, with, with uh, knocking down uh, CAV1 function with dihydropyridines, systemic administration of dihydropyridines, we think that at the maximum tolerated doses because of the peripheral side effects, you're reducing calcium influx by about 40%. Under those circumstances, I don't anticipate any severe bioenergetic consequences. Uh, and certainly patients do not report any cognitive motor or, or, or problems of any other sort. Right? Um, so I, I think I wouldn't give it to soldiers. I wouldn't give azradipine to soldiers or to soccer players. But I think for the rest of us, we're probably safe. Um, yeah, I mean, after the age of 50, I mean, we don't do those things anyway, right? Uh, at least not well. So um, the other thing is, are, are there, there absolutely is heterogeneity within the compactum. All of the studies that I've focused on are in the ventral tier. Dorsal tier neurons are clearly much less vulnerable. Even within the ventral tier, there's, uh, there are differences in vulnerability. Jose uh, has pointed out to me on several occasions that it's the more lateral regions of the compacta which innervate the putamen, which are the most vulnerable in, in Parkinson's disease. And we're trying to figure out exactly why that is. Um, collaborating with somebody who's looking at cell lineages of dopaminergic neurons in the compacta, and it's very clear that those cells have a different lineage um, and they do th some interesting things, like they co-release glutamate. This is, this is, these are not neurons that innervate the um, accumbens, or ventral striatum. These are neurons that innervate the putamen, they co-express V-glut too. So um, I think that there, there's a lot, a lot to be done there. How that plays into these vulnerability factors, I don't know. I mean, the other thing I want to emphasize is that there are lots of other factors, features of these cells which could very well contribute to their vulnerability. One of the things that we know about these cells is they have massive axonal fields. Those axonal fields clearly are going to create a proteostatic and potentially bioenergetic burden. One of the things that we've seen with knocking down electron transport chain proteins is the very first part of the cell that goes is the axon. So, and so compact neurons uh, may differ in terms of their axonal arbors, and that may have an impact on vulnerability. So thanks for the questions. Question here. Please feel free to sit yeah. so you can join the discussion. Anything that explains the sex and ethnic differences in the rates of Parkinson's disease on the mitochondrial or any of the molecular bases? Yeah, it's, it's actually amazing. I have a postdoc, a female postdoc, who's very interested in So males obviously are twice to three times as, uh, more, as likely to get Parkinson's as women. What she's done is she's looked at mitochondrial oxidant stress, particularly in, in axon terminals, and it's lower in um, female mice than it is in male mice. You know, we, we always have been, the NIH has now mandated that we look at female mice, and I'm glad that they've done that. The other thing she's shown is that you overectomize the female mice, mitochondrial oxidant stress rises to the level found in males, and then if you then apply estradiol, it goes back down. Exactly why that is is not clear to me, but it's very clear that, that estrogen <laughs> has an important impact on mitochondrial oxidant stress. So you, you've shown uh, this uh, role for um, <clears throat> an agent for hypertension, and uh, you mentioned that uh, gamma 
also has a vascular effect. I don't know exactly what the vascular effect mm -hmm. is, but when we look at the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, they are nearly identical to the vi risk factors to cardiovas for cardiovascular disease. When you think about age, quality of life, I'm not going into the genetics, that's, that's the question. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the question is, could, could these um, effects have some sort of vascular mediation? And when you're doing the genetic studies, do you, do you find uh, any coincidence with genetic studies for cardiovascular risk? I can, I can start. Yeah. Well, one of the things we know, we, there's very good evidence that exercise diminishes your risk of developing Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease. The, that effect, is, it's, it's not really controversial. The mechanisms underlying it are controversial. But I think a reasonable hypothesis is cardiovascular. One of the things, though, that in the, in the epidemiological work done with the dihydropyridines is they compared people who had um, cardiovascular disease that was managed effectively, but with different treatments. And they found no linkage. In other words, if, you, if your hypertension was managed with beta blockers or ACE inhibitors, which effectively lower your blood pressure, um, there was no change in risk of okay. Parkinson's disease. So I think there's good reason to think there's a link to cardiovascular function, but precisely what that is and how that works is not clear. You know, we, we've looked at the sort of taking the idea that maybe it's pleiotropic, the genes that drive yeah. cardiovascular also. But it turns out that the effect of uh, cardiovascular factors is if you do a mediation analysis, it's all related to the fact that these cardiovascular factors predispose to stroke. And stroke is a, a correlates with the development of dementia. In fact, there's been two studies using the national the Alzheimer's Disease Center's data, which is about two or 3,000 brains, there's no, absolutely no relationship between the presence of risk factors during life and plaque and tangle disease at death. But if you have strokes in the brain, the correlation with plaque and tangle is very strong. There's two papers on that topic. Other questions from the audience? One far in the back there. I guess you have to sprint. Be careful. <laughs> yeah. It's a lady, so less risk. I, I just wondered if anybody had done the epidemiological review of um, subjects taking dihydropyridines and Alzheimer's disease. Sorry, it's Carol Routledge from Alzheimer's Research UK. So what was the question? I'm sorry. Um, so the epidemiology data that you showed for Parkinson's disease and, and subjects that, were on, that had been taking dihydropyridines, does that same data exist for Alzheimer's disease patients? I'm aware of it. It's a good question. <laughs> I, I will say that the dihydropyridines, there's a large European trial where the dihydropyridine in early stage Alzheimer's disease. I don't know how that's gone. Anyone in the audience knows about this trial? I had a question about this large European trials. You, you mentioned um, the Alzheimer's disease sequencing project in the United States. Alzheimer's is a global problem and we have limited resources, however many resources we have, and there are alarming projections. Um, what efforts are being done at the level of the Alzheimer's disease sequencing project and higher to um, avoid fragmentation of national and even international plans in order to coordinate disease and avoid, you know, unnecessary... Okay. So, uh, I... I mentioned that I have been studying uh, families and a case control study in the Dominican Republic, which is very close to where, uh, is very close to the U.S. Uh, we are in the process of setting up a study in Mexico. Uh, it's a little touch and go right now, but all of our colleagues are safe. Uh, that will be starting sometime in the next year or two. They have 10,000 individuals we're going to try to sequence. Um, there is a, uh, the the same group that formed the IGAP study for the GWAS are coming together to share um, 
sequence data. Uh, we had to all agree on a similar platform uh, to call the variants, uh, call the sequence. That was like negotiating something like a peace agreement, uh, because everybody had their own method, but we've all agreed to, to do that. And I'm sure over the next few years, it'll be a, a global effort. And I know uh, people like Ken are working in Colombia, South America. There's others that are starting to work there. And if anybody wants to contribute data, uh, that's the surest entry. Because once you contribute a data set, then you have access to all of the data. The problem there is that um, if you have human data, you might not need it as much. It is the researchers that need human data but do not have it yes. that might make the most use of... of well, the data, data are data. available in the, in the Nyag from the Nyagets database. You can download all of the data. I mean, okay. uh, and you have to present a paragraph on what you're going to do. Uh, and there's a time-limited effect, but, you know, time-limited uh, time that you have full access to the data. Uh, but it's available, and as is the DNA. Liway, is there any human data with the gamma <laughs> and Alzheimer's? Um, actually, um, there is a, a small startup company studied um, a few human subjects now, but I think the study will ramp up very quickly to, I think, 100 subjects. Um, I think they already um, done some uh, feasibility study, which is, you know, I mean, how to induce gamma with this kind of sensory um, stimulus um, approach, what's the most optimal condition. So, so hopefully we'll get some data very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much to the speakers for the session. We will uh, be back here at 4.35. No, 4.40, mm -hmm. and uh, for the last session that will then be followed by a concert outside. Thank you very much.